Hey guys, John Vapor Owning Technologies here today. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, from the beginning of the business uh, to current today, uh, coming up on the end of 2020. Just really wanted to go back and reflect on um, the journey that we've had so far. You know, we have uh, customers in all the time and they get to hear a lot of the stories internally. Um, with the employees, specifically with the sales department, um, myself included sometimes, if I'm available and around. And, you know, they get to hear the personal stories um, about how the business started, about where the business has come from, and something that you guys may not have have heard before. And I, I think it's I think it's important to to help you guys understand kind of the the lineage of, of, of this company, um, if you will. And so I wanted to share that with you today. That's the point of the video. Um, and I hope you enjoy. So um, starting back in, we'll, we'll rewind all the way back to the beginning. Um, starting back in 2011, um, I had been working a couple jobs um, Graduated college in 2010, uh, started working a couple different jobs after that, and I was really never happy, really never satisfied with anything that I was doing, and I always wanted to run a business or start a company, and I had no idea what that was going to be at the time, and um, when I was working at my last job before I started this business, I really loved the idea of sales. Um, I was uh, obviously, at that point in my life, I was super entitled, and uh, it was a very dangerous spot for me looking back now. Um, at that time, I didn't realize this, and that was the scary part looking back, was I didn't realize that I was so entitled, because I wasn't raised that way. Um, not, not, one, you know, not, not any part of me, any of my family raised me that way. It was something that the institutions had had put inside of my head um, going to school for the past four years of my life, you know, hearing stories about not taking a job under this amount or, you know, not accepting this kind of pay. And that was a very dangerous, nasty situation because I realized real quick that um, when I got out of college, I realized real quick that the world really didn't owe me anything. And um, that was that was kind of an eye opener for me. But it took me about a year and a half to realize that. Um, and that's about the time I started dabbling in this business. And that's really, I think, what made me realize that was starting this company from the ground up, no outside investment, and, and really struggling every single day um, for looking back now for the next four to five years of my life. Um, struggling financially, um, trying to make ends meet with the business, trying to make ends meet uh, personally as well. Uh, because obviously, if you guys have ever started a business, you understand that you are putting a lot of cash and a lot of capital um, into a business. And if you don't, well, you won't have a company, you won't have a business. And um, I think that's one piece of advice I would give anyone is make sure that you store money and put it back so that you can reinvest it into your business. Whatever business that is, you know, we, we talk to a lot of companies, small, medium, and large, and they're gonna tell you the same thing. You have to have money, right? You have to have money to operate, and the only way you can do that is if, if you own the business, you're gonna have to put that money in there if you're not gonna raise capital. But anyways, moving on. Um, starting the business because I wanted more back in 2011, um, I was denied a job as a salesperson in the last company I worked for, I was told I was too young. And at that time, I decided I was going to put my two-week notice in because obviously if I was too young, then I had no way to grow in the business. And that was a huge concern for me because I wanted to make more money financially because I had intentions of doing something else one day you know, with that money, not just spending it. I wanted to invest it. And so uh, when I put my two-week notice in, I did not tell my wife. Um, I don't think we had 
previously talked about it at all. Um, I did talk to her beforehand about potentially starting the services side, vapor honing services, um, and and running that full time because I'd already been dabbling in that and we had already started to gain a lot of traction. And I talked to her about that, and um, but we didn't really talk about me just quitting my day job and diving right off into the deep end, you know, starting a business. Because again, we didn't have any clientele really built up. We didn't have a ton of cash flow and all that. So um, obviously when I went home and told her that that afternoon, um, I don't think she was very pleased with me at that time. And um, I'm not sure that I was pleased with myself and my decision because I don't think that was what I was looking for at the time. I think I was looking for an opportunity to grow with the company I was at. And that's another reminder for me too, which I'm not going to go off on that tangent, but that's something we do here inside of the companies. We allow people to grow. But um, so when I dove off into this in 2011, going into 2012, when I started a service business with vapor honing, I was one of two other guys, one of two other guys in the country. There was one guy in Oregon, I can't remember his name now, um, and then I was on the East Coast, so he was kind of handling West Coast, I was handling East Coast. We didn't have an agreement or anything. Uh, we'd never spoken, even today I've never spoken to this gentleman, at least that I know of, but um, we were handling all of the service work in the U.S., I started getting parts all over the U.S. Um, I started getting exposure to the process. And um, again, this was when when no one knew about this process back in the day. Like all of you guys watching this video today think, well, oh, this was an easy business idea, right? Or this was just easy all the way around. And quite frankly, it, it actually wasn't that simple. Like it wasn't that easy because nobody knew about this process. Like this wasn't something that people just started talking about. I mean, no one, you know, I would say 50 plus percent of the people you talk to today still, maybe more, will not know about this process. Um, it's been so hidden because quite frankly, the people who are using it, and you guys might be using it if you're watching this video, um, you usually don't talk about this process because it gives you a competitive advantage against your competition, specifically if you're building engines or you're selling parts or, you know, you're just providing a service. Like you don't want to tell people what you're doing. Um, you just want them to see the beautiful results and pay you money for that. So when I started doing this, there were hardly any searches for this type of process, um, even less for the equipment. But when I started dabbling into this, um, I started looking for equipment, professionally built equipment. And what I noticed was $24,000 was about as low as I was going to get um, to purchase a professional piece of equipment. So obviously I knew all of the advantages with buying a professional piece of equipment versus trying to do something yourself or trying to buy something used. Because when you do that, you have to figure everything out on your, you know, on your own. You're, you're stuck. You have no process. Um, the machine may break down. You might need parts someday that you can't get, so on and so forth. There's no warranty. And um, so when I found this pricing, I was quite disturbed because I couldn't afford this. Um, at that time, my wife and I were renting a, a very tiny house, and we had a little two-car carport. It was like a metal car shed. It didn't have any doors on it or anything, and we were... I would say just kind of barely getting by. Um, we didn't have cable television. We didn't have gas heat. We were heating the house with wood at that time. Like we were living a very simple cost-effective lifestyle at that time because we were trying to bank money, obviously, for a rainy day at that time or for the business. But um, so I couldn't afford $24,000. So I was super concerned uh, very disappointed, obviously. And so really, that was the very beginning of this business. When um, when I decided that I was going to build 
the first vapor honing machine that I would be using um, for a couple years. I think we we offered services, just strictly services as well for well, maybe a year and a half, um, into two years probably. Um, but when I built the first machine, obviously I didn't have any type of knowledge of the equipment. I didn't have any type of knowledge of this process or the industry or abrasive selection or pressures or distances or angles, all of those combinations that are extremely important. And obviously I didn't understand all the different applications with this process. So you can imagine there was a learning curve. I was at the very bottom, the very rock bottom, uh, which is a very scary place to be. You have no idea what you're doing and you have no idea where you're at. And that's extremely, extremely dangerous um, if you cannot find an avenue um, to get out of, to find your way out. But anyways, my persistence kept driving me to uh, to learn more each and every day I would come home from work and again this is before I actually quit I would come home from work and I would play with the process I would change the machine um, I had another engineer helping me at the time and we would dabble back and forth um, in you know in and how to how to change the machine how to make it more functional or make it functional period because it wasn't it wasn't working in the very beginning. It wasn't like I just built something and it started working. Um, this was a probably a three-year evolution to get to a good functional machine. And I think that's one of the things that pains me today when I see guys trying to do this themselves. I mean, there's a lot of idiots on the web sharing information, and they have no reason to be sharing information because they have no idea what they're doing. Um, they've never worked with this process more than a couple of hours, and most of these guys have stolen this information from companies like us. Um, they've stolen this information to try to do their own thing, and I get it. They want to call themselves entrepreneurs, but they're just thieves at the end of the day, and that's exactly how we see them because we've had some of those people that are sharing information with you. They've been into our facility, and that is the um, that is the, the worst part that you guys do not understand. Uh, most people never know. There are some people out there today, and I, I just want to reinforce this. There are people out there today that have stolen information from us internally, have taken tours, have bought products, have done all this stuff to get information. Some people have gotten free products. They've stolen information, and now they're trying to share it with you like they're experts. Um, and, and that's a very scary situation for us as a company because we're trying to educate and we're trying to provide a valuable product. And then we have thieves out there that are just trying to get a, some get rich quick scheme, which it's never going to work because there is no way to get rich quick. Um, but you guys are out there learning from these morons for the lack of a better word, um, and it's a scary situation from us. And so we try to protect you guys from some of this um, ill intent content. But I'm just telling you that because it took me a couple years to dial in a good process and to dial in a good machine. And that's all of the information that we have internally today. Um, stuff that we've worked on for nine and 10 years, you know, and then I bring in engineers and they provide another five years of experience or 10 years experience on a particular topic. And so when I was dabbling with this equipment, I started working on this process, started dialing it in. Every day I was getting more dangerous. And when I decided to go and talk to the VP of sales in the company I was working with at that time, and he told me I was too young to sell, that's when I put my two week notice in. At that time, again, I'd already been dabbling, so I had a good understanding. I already had some customers, but not enough, obviously, looking back to, to make money. But when I dove in full time, that was the life-changing moment for sure, I think, for both my wife and I, looking back now. Um, we really struggled for the probably the next three years. Um, maybe even to the fourth year. We literally, I mean, we didn't, 
We didn't like starve or anything. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is we didn't do anything. Like we really didn't go anywhere. Um, we really didn't buy anything. You know, I think people look at me and this company today and think that it's something glamorous. Um, but but I'm here to tell you that there was a lot of struggle. Like there was a there was a ton of struggle in the very beginning. And I'm not saying it's easier today. I'm saying that there's a team today that we can fall on each other and we can help everybody out. So it makes life easier today more so than it did back then. Um, because when I started out doing this, I was wearing about uh, 20 different hats and trying to manage each and every piece of a, of a startup business in the services side. But we started doing service work. Within the first couple months, I realized that I had to hire somebody to help me. So I hired um, a young gentleman who worked with me for about three or four years um, in the very beginning. And we had um, really done a lot of good things in the very beginning of this business. But we started doing services and we were filling the garage or the car shed with parts. Like we had parts coming in from all over the country. Uh, they were stacking up. I had to get shelves in there. We started stacking them on shelves. I had guys showing up on Saturday to hang out for all day and, you know, go grab something to eat, come back and pick parts up out of town. Um, it was a very awesome, wild experience. But during that time, it was not peaches and roses. We were in a building with no doors, no insulation, no heat. And you can imagine when wintertime came, it would be 18 to 20 degrees in the mornings when I had to go out to the car shed, pull the cars out. Um, my wife would go off to work. I would pull the cars out and start them up for her. And I made some makeshift plastic doors, almost like barn doors for this building in the wintertime. And we used a forced air furnace. But 18 to 20 degrees, there was not much you could do to heat a building with no insulation and sheet metal. There was just nothing you could do. So we were freezing to death most days uh, doing the services. We were soaking wet. Uh, we were dirty. We didn't have a machine that worked well. It leaked everywhere. It leaked all over us. Um, but, um, you know, moving on through that journey, we we continue to develop the process and the equipment. And I think I got ahead of myself there for a second though, because right in the beginning when I first figured out the Eureka moment, when I figured out this equipment, it was about midnight one night because I would work way into the early hours of the morning trying to figure this process out. But my wife was sleeping and I figured, I was, I was blasting a piston actually, still remember it like it was yesterday. And I was so excited when I finally figured out this process. And I went running inside, woke her up. She was super unhappy with me probably at that time because she was trying to sleep. And I told her, I said, I've just figured this out. Like, this is a game changer. This is fantastic. This is going to be the future. And um, I told her, I said, that time, I said, I'm going to get this in front of the world. I'm going to go and put this in front of Jay Leno and see what he has to say and see if he validates the process. So at that time she was like, oh, okay, that's great. You know, go for it. She never told me no. She's always been supportive from day one. And that's one of the things that, that I think that we've really done well is she's been very behind it and very supportive, even in times where she didn't probably want to. And um, so, when we continued to do the service work, what we realized was that people continued to ask where they could purchase this equipment, um, where they could, you know, buy something to do this. It was fantastic. And we had more and more of that traffic. And so I realized, okay, well, it's probably time to start focusing on building the equipment. Maybe this will work. Maybe this is something people will accept. And when I decided to do this, I realized that we had to build a machine that was an incredible value, something that was durable, something that had a warranty behind it, um, something that allowed people to trade up 
you know, when their business grew or their hobby grew, I knew that we had to have a business that stood behind the product. However, at that time, I didn't understand how we were going to do that because it was me and one other person. So uh, two people running a manufacturing business is almost impossible. I'm here to tell you. Um, you will literally work 24 hours a day. And that's exactly what I did um, for, for many, many years um, in the very beginning. But, and it was still impossible just because of the things we were trying to do. But um, we started building the equipment. I think the first year we built five or six machines. Um, every one of those machines had to be replaced. Um, it, they were just horrible. Like they, they did not work properly. Um, they looked horrible and people were super awesome back then because they supported us and they probably knew how small we were, uh, but never really let it on. And we replaced the equipment moving down the line, but the first year we sold five or six machines and I think I was super happy. I was like, woohoo, we're rich. Um, and <laughs> we were not rich. We were super broke because everything we made, we had pumped back into the business. Now that's been my rule from the very first day. It still holds true today. Um, this company makes money because it has to. It's a company and every time it makes profits, those profits go right back into the company. Um, or we share them as profit sharing with the employees today. But um, we reinvest back into the business. But um, yeah, like when we were, when we started building the equipment though, the next year went on and we continued to build, we continued to grow, we added more customers, we added more, um, more people that supported the brand and we had this vision to build and be the biggest vapor honing, wet blasting, whatever you want to call the process at the end of the day to be the biggest company in the world. And we still didn't know how we were going to do that. But we were pumped. And we had a vision, and we still have the same vision today. But we continue to go down this path. And I realized that in the garage, I had people laughing at us when they would show up. I had people, I'm sure, talking crap about us after they left just because we were at my house uh, we weren't in a presentable location. And um, so I realized that in order to change the minds of our potential customers, we had to get out into a professional looking business location. So I continued to go and speak to a gentleman um, who was an older gentleman at the time. And unfortunately, he's no longer with us today. But he was kind of a mentor for me back in the beginning. And um, I would go and I would sit in his office every day after five o'clock because I respected his time during the day. And plus I was trying to work, but I would go and sit in his office and I would ask him, you know, about business, how to run a business, how to, you know, to, to be financially healthy in a business and personally. And I always ask him if he had any space to operate in or if he had any space for lease. And finally, I think after a couple months of me, I guess, pestering him to a point that he was probably tired of hearing from me, um, he offered me a very small space. He, was, he, he said, hey, how much, how much can you afford? And I said, well, quite frankly, I can't really afford anything right now. Um, I, I wish I could, uh, but I just, I can't afford it. Like, I need the space, but I can't afford it. And he said, well... You really need to get back with me if you want some space on like what you, he said, you really need to get back with me on what you can pay. He said, you got to figure out something. And so I think we came to an agreement that it was a thousand square feet or something like that. And that I had to pay 300 bucks a month plus the utilities. And um, he said, do you think you could do that? And I said, I don't know. I said, that's a lot of money. I said, but I'm sure going to give it a shot. I said, because if you have space, um, I'm willing to, I'm willing to, to go for this. 
Um, I have I have a vision and a dream here, and if you're willing to help, I'll do everything I can to uh, to get this done. So we started moving the business to that spot. We started painting the outside of the building, the inside of the building, and uh, it was an old textile mill. It was a very small building. Uh, we weren't able to utilize the whole the whole property, but we were in this very small space. And this is when the business started to transform a little bit. Um, it kind of gave me it kind of gave me a glimmer of hope uh, for the future. Along that time when we moved, we had continued to establish our brand and our products with 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 bigger influencers and bigger people um, that that were more trusted than we were at the time, and we we decided that. We were going to develop the the polymer cabinet that we have today, that most of you know of the Bear Essentials Weekend Warrior 800 Base 800 FL. That polymer cabinet, we decided we were going to develop this machine. It was a huge undertaking, a huge cost, a huge engineering challenge. Everybody said it couldn't be done. Every engineer I talked to said it could not be done, and I finally said, "No, we're, we have to do this. Like we have to offer." A product that's reliable and that's competitively priced so that people can afford this process and not just something that's cheap something that is affordable that works over a period of time there's a difference here you can buy things that are cheap that break every day and you guys have probably bought something that's cheap that breaks but you can buy something that's affordable that lasts or that somebody's behind, right? That somebody takes care of for you, you know, moving forward. That's that's a tool, that's an investment. That's not a waste. So that's what we did. We developed this cabinet. At the time, we took over 50 orders right off the bat for the cabinet, which was unheard of at this time. And we could not build these cabinets. We were on the phone selling these cabinets I had a Bluetooth in my ear. We were building cabinets. We were selling them at the same time. We were building. We would try to sleep for a couple hours, and then we'd do it again all over. And we were still trying to do service work at the same time. And you can imagine, R&D, service, building, uh, engineering new products, sales and marketing, accounting, like all of these things had to be done, shipping. And um, so... When we, when we started losing a couple orders because we were taking weeks and months uh, to get this done, we realized that we had to continue to step it up, and that really didn't change, though. We knew we had to step it up, but we really didn't know how to get there. We didn't have enough people. We didn't have enough room. So at that time, the business started growing. Our metal product line, our stainless steel, and our carbon steel started to grow as well. And when... When we, when we started to grow that much, um, I think we had three or four total people working, including myself at this time. We had started storing stuff outside. Um, we just didn't have enough room in the building to, to work plus store. So we started storing all this stuff outside and that was a nightmare again, going back to the winter time. It was a horrible idea because it would snow on it. It would freezing rain. It was just wet and cold. But a lot of times we had to work outside too because we didn't have enough room in the building. We were trying to build so many things and get them shipped out. And, um, you know, dad would come over uh, at this time because I think he was he was uh, in the beginning of retirement. And he would help out during the day. We would ship stuff. Um, he was an absolute trooper during this whole period of time, too, trying to help grow the business. Because everybody thought I was a maniac in the beginning anyways, and some of them probably still do today, some of my family. But... Um, when we continued to grow, I finally had a part-time employee that came to me one day and said, hey, I think there's a property for sale in Lincolnton, which was my hometown growing up. I think there's a property for sale. You might be interested. Go check it out. Because he knew we needed to move. Like, I knew we needed space. I'd been looking at properties. They were way too expensive. Um, we could not afford the properties that were on the market. I mean, very small square footages. And um, so 
went and looked at this property. It was abandoned. It was dilapidated. It was foreclosed, but it was massive. It was uh, 130 or 140,000 square feet total uh, between three separate buildings. And that's exactly where we wound up was here in Lincolnton at that property. It took me a couple months to assess the property and, and figure out what all the repairs and maintenance were going to be. At least I thought I'd figure that out. Come to find out later, it cost 10 times more than what I had allowed or even thought about. And it cost or it took three times as long to get it done. But that was in 2017 when we purchased this property in Lincoln. And that was some of the most, I had thought that I had been through probably the toughest times in the business. That was some of the toughest times that I've ever been through in my entire life. Um, I'm here to tell you today, I've never been so tired. I've never been so sleepless. Since we didn't have a lot of money, we were trying to do all of the renovations that we could and all the repair work that we could with our own time after work. This property is so freaking huge that it was killing me. Like it was, I lived at that time, we still lived at the current residence that we were renting. And I was driving over 30 minutes back and forth every day. And the 30 minute drive wasn't the big kicker. It was the fact that I was driving 30 minutes at three o'clock in the morning after working 24 plus hours without sleep. That was the problem. And this was on a very consistent basis. So what happened was I started falling asleep. Um, I, I started falling asleep on the way to the house. I would wake up at stoplights. I would wake up at stop signs. I would wake up in my garage with the truck running and park somehow. I have no idea, still to this day, have no idea how some of this stuff happened. Um, you know, going on shows, falling asleep, running off the road, somehow f correcting it before we come back onto the road and, and not wrecking and not hitting someone and not killing ourselves. Um, I had never been so tired. And I really didn't think at that time that there was a way out, um, truthfully. Uh, I had a couple people around me that were still working in the business I really did not think there was a way out. I thought I had seriously buried myself so deep in work on the property that I would never be able to work on VHT again and that the property would go down and everything would just start spiraling down. So it was kind of a gut check moment for me where you have to literally look yourself in the mirror and you have to be you have to be serious. You have to say you have to say am I man enough to continue going forward or am I going to quit like a little sissy? Um and obviously I chose the the tougher route because I was not going to be a quitter. Um, and I've been this way from day one and I'll always be this way. And this is something I try to tell the employees today, like never quit, never give up. I don't give a darn how hard it is. I don't care how tough it is. Don't quit. I don't care how many people are spitting on you, cursing at you, pushing you down. Cause that's just the way the world is. There's nasty people out there, but never quit. So you have to have that never quit mentality and that, I that ideology. And that's where I came to a point where I had to make a decision. I had to say, I'm going to keep going and we're going to keep growing the business and we're going to renovate the property or I'm just going to stop and shut down and be a quitter and I'll live with it for the rest of my life. And I had to, to make those decisions. But moving on, we I somehow survived. We, we were going into the wintertime, I think, in 2017 and 18 and that's when I came down with pneumonia um, because I was so run down probably about a year into the project and I was so tired that I literally could barely stay awake I mean any given time of the day because you got to think I'd been running the the manufacturing business now for a couple years with very little sleep uh, nights weekends early mornings you name it and um, 
now I just jumped into another startup type business um, with you know with the real estate and the property that VHT will work out of. All of a sudden, I just started this new venture that is also going to take just as much time, and I don't know where it's going to come from. I don't know where the money's going to come from and all that. So I came down with pneumonia, um, got super sick that New Year's, couldn't barely move, couldn't barely breathe. The doctor looked at me in the room and, sh and she said, she said, Jonathan, do you want to live another day or do you want to kill yourself working? And I said, well, I prefer to live, obviously. Um, I think that, you know, right now there's a lot of stuff to be done and um, it wouldn't be a good position to leave my wife in. So she said, well, you need to slow down. Like you have to stop. She said, I don't care if it's just a couple weeks. You have to let your body recover. She said, you have, you have drawn your body down so low that your immune system is so compromised and so weak. She said, you are deathly sick. Like you have a very serious case of pneumonia. You are not well. You cannot continue to go or you will not make it. And I said, well, okay, I will rest for a couple days and I'll get back to work. So I recovered after a couple days, uh, well, a couple weeks, and uh, went back into work, of course, of course, full full speed ahead again. But that was another life lesson for me. That was another um, <clears throat> another example for me, you know, in this whole journey. Was again, like you have to, there are, you have to pick your battles. There are times where you have to stop for a day or two days, but then the rest of the time you have to continue to push hard. And because I think one of the things that that frustrates me the most today and it has for for the many years I've been doing this, there are so many internet gurus out there. You have guys that claim to get rich, that do it in their boxers at their house or they do it while they're on the beach in Hawaii. Um, and you can do it by yourself and you can make millions, you know, for a couple hours of work a week. All that crap is bogus. Like that stuff is just ridiculous mess. Um, there's no get rich quick scheme. Like there's a lot of work that has to be done. And if you don't put in the time, you're not, you're not going to reap the rewards. You have to put in your time investment. You have to put in the money investment and it, you have to continually do this. Like you can't just do it for a little bit and quit. Otherwise, nothing's going to come out of it. I mean, you've heard people say where there's great risk, there's great reward. Well, well, when there's massive action, there's massive reward as well. And that's something people don't tell you much. You know, that people just want you to think that it's easy, right? And that it's uh, you can be a millionaire overnight, and uh, you can grow a business with uh, four hours of work a week, and you can do it in your spare time. But that was my life lesson there was to slow down for a couple, you know, a couple hours or a couple days, you know, during the year, and then you push the rest of the year. So you might, you know, you might rest, let's say, 10 or 15 total days out of the year um, spread out through the year, but the rest of the time you're just going, you're 18, 20 hour days. And, um, you know, moving forward, when we finally moved into the property, here in Lincolnton, that's when the business really started to really to develop. We had a ton of space. At that time, we'd open up into 25,000 square feet. So you can imagine from 1,000 square feet to 25,000 square feet, like we didn't have enough of anything to fill that space. So we had so much empty space. I was like, gosh, we have space for days. Like we can have all kinds of room for growth. And as we went along, we filled the space up and all of a sudden now 25,000 square feet looks tiny compared to what it used to. But what people have to understand is that we came from such a small space. And that was another good lesson for me too back then was you always have to start small with something and then you can grow it from there. You always have to put a good foundation down and then you can grow something big, something that will last. And you have to crawl before you can walk. You've heard all these analogies before. But that was another good life lesson for me too once we got here and we, we started establishing ourselves. And so, <coughs> excuse me, you know, transitioning on through 2017, 2018, 
Um, we started to see tremendous growth with the company, with the brand, because back in 2016, I forgot to mention this, I don't know how, back in 2016, and we had introduced the product on Jay Leno's Garage. And that was a <laughs> that was another milestone for uh, for me and this company and for this product and process because we had the endorsement of Jay Leno. And if you guys know him at all or what he does, like he is a massive supporter of American based companies and products that work, quite frankly. Because if they don't work, he's not going to show them off, period. Um, you can't pay him enough money to do this. Like You can't pay him any money at all. If he likes it, he likes it, and he'll show it off. If not, he will not. That's just the way he works. And, and so we had introduced the product to the world back then. The video came out like a year later, I think in 17, um, if I'm correct. And that's really what changed everything for us and changed our mentality. And it really helped us, obviously, as the business has continued to progress, and it still does today. But um, when we started to grow here in 2018 and then into 19, we had tremendous growth. We've had tremendous growth ever since. We've hired people every single year, uh, people that are staying with the company now for extended periods of time. I mean, we have employees here that are working on the, I guess, the third and fourth year of of you know, of working here at VHT. And so we have hit such a tremendous growth um, spurt here, and we haven't stopped since we moved to this location. And I, we really associate it to the people that we hire. So the basically the, the community that we build here, the culture that we have, um, who we are as a company, what we do as a company, and then our customers um, that are ultimately driving all of that. And so we really associate to, uh, that to our success because we or our success because we are extremely focused on you as the customer. Because over the last couple of years with these growth spurts that we've had, we have not been able to keep up. Um, it's such a great thing to have, it's such a great problem to have, but up until 2020, this year, we could not keep up. I mean, we could not build products fast enough. We had so many negative people uh, because Amazon, let's face it, Amazon Prime has spoiled everybody. They want things in two days. And, you know, they don't realize that we don't, we don't produce thousands of these things a day. Now, we do produce probably 20 to 30 units a day now. The biggest thing is, um, we hand build everything. So we, we have, we have, um, everything is custom done in house. We, we take a lot of time and a lot of care in doing this. And so what we, what we experience is we experience some issues sometimes with, with, with shipping in a, in what the customer perceives to be a reasonable time. Again, that's two days. Normally they want it to ship stupid fast. And we're really trying to hit that goal. Sometimes we go above and beyond. Sometimes we fall short. It just depends what happens. It's not like we choose to do this. It's just what happens. But um, when, when all of this stuff transpires, like we continue to learn from it. And that's one of the things that in 2020, when we really started to produce the product in a timely manner and we started to get better and more efficient with it, we started to, to build basically back what um, some very nasty people tried to tear apart. And normally what we experience too, when I talk about nasty people, normally those are the people that bought the cheapest product that we have, but they expect the most service. And we don't personally look down on that customer, but apparently the customer looks at us a different way. And so oftentimes it's challenged us, you know, to even offer the competitive products that we do, you know, at the price points we do, because those are the most problems that we have. So again, that's where we, that's where we make decisions and we make, we make business moves 
because we we have influence with customers, but um, you know, in 2020, we've really you know we've really cleaned things up, but we've also really evaluated a lot of areas because of some of the customers. You know, we this business began because we wanted to start building an affordable product that worked. But at the same time, those people were the people and sometimes are the people that give us the most grief. We can sell a $100,000 machine and have less problems and less issues and less concerns than a product that, um, than a product that cost, um, you know, 800 bucks. So with that being said, um, we are super excited about 2021 and we're always super excited to take care of you as the customer. And I really look forward to what we do in the future and all the customers that we meet in the future because, you know, right now, one of the big things that we love as a company is we love to see the stories and hear the stories of all of the customers that we deal with. And, and we love to figure out how we can help those customers in dealing with that. So I hope that you guys have enjoyed this process and enjoyed hearing this story. I'm sure I've left parts out again and I may get back with you at another time to try to fill those in. But we are extremely excited moving forward in 2021. We hope that you guys are as well uh, moving forward with us and we will always be here to support you. If you guys have never heard about our lifetime warranty, our trade-up option, then you guys should certainly talk to the sales department in, 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 in hearing some of that information because those are two of the biggest programs that we offer as a company. And we would love to share that information with you because we think it'll be life-changing for you moving forward in the future with us as a company. But those are things that really separate us as a brand as well. But Again, if you have not done business with us, we look forward to doing business with you in the future. If you have, we hope that things are going well. And if they are, then let us know. If they are not, then also let us know um, so that we can help fix that. But as always, thanks for watching and stay tuned for more content to come.